The people of Constantinople may keep their possessions. There will be no looting. In return, you will open the gates of the city and kiss the hands of our Sultan. Sultan Mehmed will be the one ruler of the Romans. This message is going to be dynamic. You're going to want to take notes. It is entitled the first and second saw. You're going to learn that the first saw was a picture of the second saw. Now, Saul was hiding when he was about to be anointed king. Now, the commentaries tell us that this suggests a great fear on Saul's part, which might be understandable given the responsibility that he was now given. Now, that's the white man's commentary. Now, I know for a fact that there are some things that's been hidden from the foundation of the world. This is the reason why Jesus spoke in parables. Saul was nowhere to be found when the lot identified him, and after a search, they found him hiding among the baggage, or the King James renders the stuff. This is going to be in 1 Samuel 10, 21, and 22. Read that on your own. I have so much to go over. Now, both of the King Saul's, the first saw and the second saw both dealt with witchcraft. Now, if you was to type in witchcraft in your 66 book King James Bible, the first time witchcraft is mentioned is with the first saw. The last time witchcraft is mentioned is with the second saw. Now, this is no coincidence. So don't let this get past you. Now, let's keep going. Both of the King Saul's brought up dead prophets. The first king Saul attempted to bring back the prophet Samuel from the dead. And most of us, even the Christians, agree that he brought back a familiar spirit. And I teach right here in the house of David that the second Saul attempted to bring back a so-called dead prophet, and that is the prophet Isa. And I agree that that right there is a familiar spirit, which is witchcraft, sorcery, divination. All these things could be seen in the life of Joseph when he planted his cup of divination in Benjamin's sack. Now, Paul is from the tribe of Benjamin, and the symbol of Benjamin is the wolf. So both of the saws brought up dead prophets. Now, those scripture references is going to be 1 Samuel 28, 6 all the way down. Now, I want to read that. Verse 6, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that have a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that have a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. See, this is going into the wolf and sheep clothing. This is going into the Ahab who loves to disguise himself. This is all Paul. And he went and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me that's going into divination unto me by the familiar spirit and bring me him up whom i shall name unto thee and the woman said unto him behold thou knowest what saul hath done how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land therefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die now i've been doing a series on bible experts now for those who are experts in the scriptures, we can already see that this is Christianity metaphorically. Because just like the first Saul was killing the witches, and then he started believing in the witches. It's the same exact thing with King Saul of the New Testament. Your boy Paul, he went from killing the Christians to believing in the Christians. Verse 9. Let's read that again. And the woman said unto him, Behold, 
Thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then thou layest a snare for my life to cause me to die. And Saul swear to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to you for this thing. Now, I have to stop right here because a lot of y'all, this just goes right over your head. You don't understand how wicked this thing is right now that we're reading. Now, the Bible says in the book of Exodus, the first time which is even mentioned, it's in Exodus 22 and 18. It reads, thou shall not suffer a witch to live. So according to the commandments, the children of Israel were supposed to kill all the witches. Now, Saul is promising this witch eternal life. Now, that is what Paul is doing in Christianity. He is promising the witches, okay? The Christians are witches. Christianity is witchcraft. He's promising these witches eternal life. And then you wonder why in the nation of Islam, we have the right to jihad. And there's coming a day when we will get rid of all of the witches. So you see how wicked this man is? He's promising this witch eternal life. Okay, and I'm speaking metaphorically of the Christians. But actually, he's promising this witch her life when he is supposed to kill her. And he's doing it in the name of the Lord. Okay, this is exactly equal to him proclaiming to be the father, okay? When God made Abraham a father of many nations, it was all going into how Paul became the false Abraham over many nations. And that's another message. I don't want to take you too far from the topic. So here we have the wickedness of Saul. This man just promised life to a witch when he's supposed to kill her. Going on. Let's go back to verse 9. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits. Now I brought you back here so you can see that this is Christianity. Paul went from killing the churches to being a part of the churches. Actually becoming the, the founder of of the church. He, he, he built churches, okay, in many places in his day. And right now, he is the founder of what we call Christianity today. Wherefore then thou layest a snare for my life to cause me to die. And Saul, listen, swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to you for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, an old man come up up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and answer me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called you that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then thou ask of me, saying the Lord is departed from thee and is become thine enemy. Now this is advanced. Samuel is basically saying, I'm not a middleman. If you are in trouble with God, how can I help you? If you are in trouble with God, there is no man that can help you. You see that mediator religion? It's Christianity. And in the nation of Islam, we don't believe in no middleman. No. Okay. That's what we have right here. This is what's going on right here in Christianity. They believe that if you are in trouble with God, another man can help you. And you see, we have the prophet 
whom God did not allow any of his words to touch the ground. And he is telling us the absolute truth. If you are in trouble with God, how could Samuel help you? If you are in trouble with God, how could Jesus help you? Okay, this right here goes against what we call Christianity. Now watch this. I've been teaching that Paul is the enemy of God. And most people that probably heard that like, wow, where do you get that from? I'm going to show you. Watch this. Verse 16. Then said Samuel, wherefore then thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from you and is become your enemy. God has become your enemy, Saul. And that's exactly why I call Saul, the second Saul, the enemy of God. And it is written that Judah's hands shall be in the neck of his enemies. All you brothers talking about you from the tribe of Judah and all this stuff. Your hands ain't in the neck of Paul. You love Paul, okay? You ain't exposing Paul. You agree with the teachings of Paul just like the white man. But the real Judas, okay, their hands shall be in the neck of their enemy, and the enemy of God is Paul. So according to the Bible, the prophet Samuel called Saul God's enemy. And it's the same thing with the second Saul. Now let's go to verse 17. And the Lord hath done to him as he has spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, even to David. So there's coming a day when the kingdom will leave the Christians, which is the house of Saul, because it belongs to the house of Paul. Okay, that's how real this stuff is. The house of Saul is Christianity. And there's coming a day when the kingdom is going to leave the most powerful military on the planet, the USA. The Americans, the Christians, and it's going to go to the house of David, which is Islam. Now, this is just the truth. Verse 18, because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore, have the Lord done this thing unto you this day. Saul was supposed to kill off all the Amalekites, including the king Amalek, but he let them live so look how these christians sound in the comments talking about the prophet was a murderer and and god never tells nobody to kill nobody you got a you got a problem you got a problem because the reason why saul got the kingdom snatched from him is because he didn't kill off the nation of edom he didn't kill off the amalekites OK, that's what got him in trouble. And that was just one of the things this man has done. There's many things that Saul has done. Let me tell you something. The Bible says that Benjamin's mess was five times over. That is telling you that what Saul did was even greater than the sin of Adam. That's why the Bible speaks over your head when it calls Christ the last Adam. The first Adam made a huge screw up, but the last Adam Prophet Isis twin, Paul, made a huger mess than even the first Adam. Okay, I told you this is advanced. Going on, verse 19. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. So the sons of Saul is going to be a ransom for the Muslims. For the Hadith tells us that God will give every Muslim a Jew and a Christian, and he will say, this is your ransom from the fire. You see, the Christians have it all wrong. They say Jesus died for them. No, the church is gonna die for Jesus, and the church is gonna die for the Muslims. For it is written, God will give every Muslim a Jew and a Christian. And he will say, this is your rescue from the fire. In other words, they going to go into the fire for you. Okay. Now, there we have from the Bible reference the first time of a man trying his best to bring back a so-called dead prophet. And that prophet was the prophet Samuel. Peace be upon him. Now, this is the first time this has ever happened in the Bible. 
And it was by a man by the name of King Saul. Now, let's go to the second Saul. In Luke 16, there is a parable about a rich man and a poor man. The poor man was Christ, and the rich man was Paul. You see, Jesus was trying to give you some eye saw. Paul is in hell. In the Albuquerque, it tells us that there's a prison in hell named after Paul. In the Arabic tongue, it is called Bulas. So let's go all the way down to verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Now let's rewind. That's exactly what King Saul did. He tried his best to bring back a dead prophet. And right here, the first time in the Bible a person speaks of someone coming back from the dead is right here in this parable, and it is Paul, okay? Now, in 1 Corinthians 15 and 3, it tells us that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And Paul is the only one in the New Testament who is constantly telling us that Christ rose from the dead. Now, there's no need to go through all the scriptures because most of you who are Christians are familiar with all of the passages where Paul is talking about Jesus coming back from the dead. So right here in this parable, the person that's talking about somebody coming back from the dead, guess where he at? He's in hell. Verse 31, and he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Though one rose from the dead. If they don't hear Moses, if they don't hear the prophets, they're not going to hear someone, though they rose from the dead. Now, the man that brought that teaching is Paul, okay? He is the rich man. And according to the hey deeps, according to the parables, he is in hell. Now, going on, we just brought out how the first Saul was attempting to bring back a prophet from the dead, and that is the ministry of the second Saul. He is trying his best to bring back a so-called dead prophet, but he can't because in the Quran it tells us, neither did they kill him nor crucify him, for Allah took him. So now let's look at some more of what both of the Sauls have in common. Now, this is going to be, they both killed the church. Now, let's go to 1 Samuel 22 and 12. And Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my Lord. And Saul said unto him, Why have you conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse, in that that thou hast given him bread, a sword, and hast inquired of God for him? that he should rise against me to lie in wait as at this day. Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law? And go at thy bidding, and is honorable in thine house. Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. Let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father. For thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. And the king said, Thou shalt surely die. Ahimelech. Now Ahimelech is the priest. He is the high priest. Thou and all thy father's house. And the king said unto the footmen that stood about him, Turn and slay the priest of the Lord because their hand also is with David, and because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priest of the Lord. And the king said to Doag, now Doag was an Edomite, and this is a picture of Christ returning and destroying Paul's church. Now I'm going to keep going. And Doag the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priest. And slew on that day 
four score and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. So this Edomite killed 85 priests. There's coming a day, I believe, that the prophet Isa will destroy 85% of the Christian church and the remaining 15% must convert to Islam, okay? Now going on. And no, the city of the priests smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. So a lot of Christians don't know that King Saul killed the church of his day. Now, in the New Testament, Acts 8 and 1 through 3, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, this is Paul, he made havoc of the church entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. So is it a coincidence that both of the Saul's brought back dead prophets? Is it a coincidence that both of the Saul's killed the church of their day? And I have more. I have more. Both of the Saul's were beheaded. Both of the Saul's were wicked. Both of these Saul's is from the tribe of Benjamin. Wake up, okay? Both of the Saul's were fathers over David, okay? King Saul was the father of David, okay? And metaphorically, Paul was the father over the prophet Isa, okay? When Jesus was talking that father, 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 father stuff, he was talking about Paul. Because Jesus was under the curse of Canaan, all because of Ham, looking upon his father's nakedness, his son was cursed as a result and had to be a servant of servants. And that's exactly what Paul did, the false Abraham. That's why God added Ham to Abraham's name, okay, when he made him a father of many nations, is because Paul proclaimed to be the father and his son, the prophet Isa, had to be cursed as a result of it. OK, he had to be a servant of servants and he has to die at the last day. OK, a picture of him is seen in the killing of the firstborn. OK, which is the last plague. And the Quran tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause the prophet Isa to die. So we have both of the saws killing the churches, consulting in witches, trying their best to bring back so-called dead prophets. And the last one is going to be sacrifice. Now keep in mind, Saul is the only prophet in the Bible who offers a sacrifice, okay? Out of order, completely out of order. And Paul is the only self-proclaimed apostle who made a sacrifice in the New Testament. Now, that's in Acts 20. You got to read that on your own. Both of these men are in the sin of sacrifice. What's the biggest sin of Christianity? Sacrifice. Now, I have a scripture in Samuel. This is going to be 1 Samuel chapter 2 and 25. Let's get that real quick. 1 Samuel 2 and 25. It reads... If one man sin against another, we have a judge. The judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? In other words, if you sin against God, who is going to be the mediator? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. Now there's coming a day. When God is going to put down Christianity, okay? Christianity is a religion that God hates. He hates Christianity above all religions, okay? Hands down. Now let's deal with the sin of sacrifice in both of the souls. We're going to stay in the same chapter. Let's go to verse 29. 
Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons. Now the only time the word honorest is in the Bible is right here in verse 29. And honor your sons above me. Now hold up, pause Christians. You heard that? God is checking Eli because he is honoring his kids above the father. And that's what you idolatrous Christians are doing. You are exalting a so-called son above the father. And this is courtesy of Paul. Right here we see the biggest sin in sacrifice. Right here in 2 Samuel. You want to write that down. The sin of sacrifice always exalts the son above the father. And that is the problem in Christianity. Is because it exalts the son above the father. And right here this man is about to have both of his children killed. Because he's doing that. And if you continue to read. You'll see that a man of Benjamin came on the scene with the news telling Eli that both of his kids had been killed in the battle. Now, both of the kids is going into the pair of balls. It's going into Jezebel. Get it? Jesus, Paul, Jesus, ball. It's going into the father and son religion. The two golden calves and these two sons is going into Paul and the prophet Esau. Paul was beheaded. One son's down, but the last son, which is going to be a sad but sweet death. There's going to be a lot of mourning. And there's going to be a cry, such as a cry that you've never heard throughout the earth. And that is going to be the death of the prophet Isa, because it's an honorable death. Okay? And after his death, God will get all the glory back. That you put upon Paul and that you try to put upon the prophet Esau. 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 Saul makes a sacrifice on the battlefield. He got scared because the people was leaving him. And so he offered a sacrifice. He presumed to take on an office of a priest. He was supposed to wait for Samuel before he offered the sacrifice. Just like we are supposed to wait. For the prophet Isa to die at the last day. The killing of the firstborn is the last plague. Not the first plague, Christians. And the sin of sacrifice is something that the Old Testament Saul had a problem with. And with the second Saul, or the New Testament Saul, had a problem with it. They both was rushing the sacrifice of the Lord. And King Saul did this again. He was supposed to kill off Amalek. But what was he doing? He was making sacrifices again. He was supposed to kill off all the sheep, but he kept some of the choice sheep. And this man was offering sacrifices. Now, back in the day, they used to always say, Obedience is better than sacrifice. Now, you know where that came from? That came from 1 Samuel chapter 15. When Saul saluted Samuel and told him, hey, you know, I kept all these sheep to offer sacrifices to the Lord. And Samuel checked him and said, obedience is better than sacrifice for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity. So when I say Christians is witches is not being rude, it's, it's telling the truth. Christianity is nothing but witchcraft. You see, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He have also rejected thee from being king. Now let's go to verse 28. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and look at the wordplay, and have given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than you. Islam is better than Christianity. That's the bitter truth. I know it hurts. Verse 29, and also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent. Because guess what, Paul? 
Guess what, Christians? For he is not a man. For he is not a man that he should repent. All the sons of men repent. And according to the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will settle what Prophet Isa and Allah differed. He's going to settle what we all differed about. Okay, just like Samuel told us, if you are in trouble with God, how can I help you? And we see that the most honorable person in the house of Saul was the prophet Isa. And the prophet Isa will break away from the yoke of his brethren and he will come back and he will descend amongst us as a just ruler and he will destroy the cross. Now, I talk about this a lot. And I go into further detail on some of my other videos. The real truth is, is that your pastor is blind, your church is blind. These Israelite camps are blind. I wonder what they're going to do next once they find out that Paul has been the wolf in sheep clothing. I truly believe they're going to start trying to break away from Paul. And there's going to be a huge division because some people are still going to accept Paul and some people are going to reject Paul. Assalamu alaikum to my brothers and sisters in the real truth. True, 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 true.